sometimes after we've been quite confident of our faith and we figured it out and we have fortressed ourselves even with scriptures but then there comes an overwhelming tremendous crisis there comes a time when the furnace is heated seven times hotter there comes the test of all tests to your life an overwhelming crisis strikes your home or your family the question will come am I paying for my past sins Now, there are consequences to sin. There's judgment against those who don't judge their sins in the fear of God. And the truth is, there's little fear of God left in the world today. There are consequences if we don't humble ourselves before God. If we don't have a broken spirit and a contrite heart. The Bible says, God says, I chasten all my sons and daughters. He said, if you're without chastening, you're not a son. You're not a daughter. And he said, at times it's grievous. He said, but I'm working something out in you. He's working something out in us under chastening. And we have to stand by sometimes when we see the judgments of God. But you see, his judgments are melted, mended with great mercies. But listen to me. If the enemy is coming to you now, tell him whom he loves he chastens and you are never more loved than when you're under chastening whom the Lord loves he chastens you can stand still and say no I will not take these lies and you begin to stand on these words we are justified freely we're redeemed by grace through faith in his blood we declared his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through his forbearance meaning for his patience all guilt all condemnation are lifted when you come to the blood of Jesus Christ and you believe what he promised there's now therefore no condemnation to them that be in Christ Jesus the great victory of the cross too is that he bore all our griefs and all our sorrows Isaiah 53, 3 and 4. He's despised and rejected of men. He's a man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. And he's carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. And that word grief in Hebrew is pain weakness, weariness, sickness, sorrows. Nothing can pierce the pain until we begin to cry out to the Holy Ghost, until the Holy Ghost comes. Thank God for caring people. Thank God that I'm secure in Christ. Thank God that He's taken care of my regrets and brought peace and that His mercy took on a face that was touched with the feelings of my infirmities and he knows my grief and he knows my sorrows and he knows my pain. He's been there. He's been through it. And he says, I can't stop it yet because if you're coming to me and you're going to fulfill your eternal purpose, I have to take you through the fire. I have to take you through the flood. And if I don't, your best has been aborted. I have to do this because I want you to glorify me all through eternity. And I can't explain it to you. And I know the Lord would say, I'd love to pull back the curtain. I'd like to tell you why. But I can't. And he never will. But that's how important faith is. Now, this is how important it is that we stand strong no matter what happens. To lay down our lives even at the cross. To be willing to die. Willing to be a martyr, whatever it takes. Oh God, I'm going to trust you in the fire. And though you slay me, yet will I trust you. But without the Holy Spirit coming down upon us, without an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, without a daily infusion of the Holy Spirit, this is impossible. We can't set our own hearts. We can't build our own faith. There has to be a cry comes the body of Christ Jesus. There has to be a cry that comes from the body. Oh, Holy Ghost, you were sent to comfort me. You were sent to heal me. You were sent to take me through my grief and my sorrows. And Holy Ghost, come down. 
Lift your hand and say, Holy Ghost, come upon me right now. Refresh me. Touch me. This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindell, Texas, 75771, or calling 903-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to friends. My message this morning, a time to do nothing, but trust. A time to do nothing, but trust. Hallelujah. Open your Bible to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, and and anywhere in 1 Samuel, and just leave it there. First Samuel, uh, I'm going to chapter 14 just because it's in the middle somewhere. As I don't quite know where I'm going to refer you to before this is all over. A time to do nothing but trust. My God, you have been teaching us to lean on you. We, you have been teaching us, Lord, that if we wait upon you, and we will honor your word, your covenant word, that you, ha- you will not lie, you cannot lie, that you will keep us, you will sanctify us, you will give us your righteousness, you will answer prayer, you will do those things that you promised by covenant. But now, Lord Jesus, we pray for the word this morning, that you will quicken it to our ears, that we may hear it, that it may change our lives. Lord, th- this word this morning has done something in me, and I want it to do the same in all who hear it this morning. Lord, I don't have to beg you to anoint me. You have done that. But I ask you to take your word that is anointed and, and push it, uh, anoint it, and drive it, if you must, into our hearts so that it becomes reality. So that we just don't sing these songs about trust as we did, trust and obey, and then not do it. Help us, Lord, to practice what we sing and what we preach. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Israel... Uh, begged for a king, as you know, and Saul was chosen. The scripture says that Samuel poured a flask of oil on his head, and the Bible said he kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to rule over his inheritance? There's no greater compliment that God can pay to a man as he did to Saul. The Bible said God is with you. You are a chosen vessel. The Bible said also that God changed his heart. He changed his heart completely to equip him and enable him to do the job that he was anointed for. The Spirit of God came upon him mightily so that he prophesied. Saul was not a boaster. He was not a proud man. In fact, the Bible uh, tells us clearly that there was a time he was very little in his own eyes. Remember when he was sent to find his father's lost donkeys and he returns after visiting with Samuel. Samuel has anointed him to be king. He's got this incredible news that's hidden in his heart. He's not going around saying, hey, do you know that I've been anointed? In fact, his uncle comes to him and says, uh, his uncle knew that Samuel never met with anybody without a purpose. This great man of God's words about said never fell to the ground. So there was never a time that he spoke to a man without meaning and purpose. And his uncle said, tell me, what did Samuel say to you? You've got to tell me. And the scripture says, but he did not tell him the matter of the kingdom which Samuel had mentioned. How many of you could have held the secret? I would have blabbed it all over the town. I'd had somebody with a trumpet ahead of me or something. Well, maybe not, but I mean, I'm trying to excuse you for not saying amen to that. But you see, he's not a braggart, he's not a boaster. Samuel calls the nation together to Mizpah, first of all, to chasten them for turning away from God, their king, to a human king. And at the same time, God, in his mercy, uh, uh, anoints this man, and he's to introduce him, not Mizpah, as king of Israel, anointed by Samuel. And so 
by Lot, uh, Saul's clan, his family, is drawn out of the crowd. And then Saul, by Lot, is chosen, and they call his name, and he can't be found. And the Bible said he was hiding in the, among the baggage. That's, you know, the, the whole nation's gathered together. They've got carts. They've got, uh, uh, <clears throat> they're staying there for a week of celebration, probably. And they've got all of their belongings and their tents, a huge pile, and he's hiding in there somewhere. They send a delegation, they get him, and boy, when he comes out before that massive crowd, it must have been some shout because Saul was head and shoulders and better looking than any man in Israel, the Bible says. And really, Samuel said, didn't he something? Well, the words are like this. Surely there's no one like him among all the people. There's no one like this man. Head and shoulders above every soldier, above every man in Israel. And he's, the Bible says, one of the most handsome men Here's a man that's talented, he has been equipped by the Holy Ghost, uh, humble, and uh, called by God, and very valiant, strong personality. Who wouldn't want him as king? The Bible says that the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily when he heard that Jabez Gilead was under attack by Ammonites. The Spirit of God said, who uh, came upon him, and he's thinking, who is this devil who thinks he can conquer God's people. And he conscripts an army of 330,000. And they win a marvelous victory. A marvelous victory. In fact, at this time, God was so, he was so full of God, the scripture says that Saul and all the people, all the men of Israel, rejoiced greatly, giving praises to God. The scripture says that this man, now when Saul had taken the kingdom over Israel, he fought against his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the sons of Ammon, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. And wherever he turned, he inflicted uh, punishment upon them. And he acted valiantly. He defeated the Amalekites, delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. Amazingly used of God. Yet this same man, mighty in the spirit, died in rebellion against Almighty God. And the last consultation he had, the last conversation before he went into eternity, was with a witch. Became a madman. A man to whom God refused to speak. And one of the saddest commentaries in the Bible is a man of God who says in his dying time, God didn't talk to me anymore. Not by prophets, not by his word, not by voice. God has cut me off. What a sad ending to this man. This man goes in a downward spiral into insanity and madness. And if I look at this man and I see what happens to him, and I say, where is the pivotal point? Where is the point at which this man began to disintegrate? Is there any singular moment that you can point to in his life that he has changed from this humble anointed, called man of God, a praying man, a believing man at that time, at least outwardly. It looked good. There were great promise. In fact, God had, God had intended fully, the scripture says, to cause his kingdom to continue. God had plans for this man. There is a pivotal point. It's the same pivotal point that all of us reach who turn away from faith and go our own way into flesh and try by our wit and wisdom to accomplish what God said can be accomplished only by trusting Him. And it comes in the 13th chapter of uh, 1 Samuel. 13th chapter of Samuel, we find the pivotal point, and from that point on, you, you see this downward spiral. And I want to take you through this downward spiral. I want to show you the consequences of not fully trusting God. Let's not talk about the sins we totem pole sins, you know, like we put adultery and fornication over sexually up here and on and on down. And somewhere down there on the bottom of the pile are some of these things called unbelief and envy and jealousy and all these things. That is wrong. That's an inverted process and we'll show it to you here. In the course of this message, the 15th chapter begins with an account 
of gathering war clouds over Israel. Don't try to find it. Just look this way. Just leave it open in your lap. War clouds are gathering. The Philistines have, have gathered together a huge army. And when Israel looked from the hillsides into those great valleys and saw that gathering army, they said it was like the sands of the seashore for number. The Bible says there were 30,000 chariots and, and thousands of horsemen, a great cavalry. And they had the latest weapons and the chariots were rumbling and the, the swords were glistening in the sun. And Israel looked at their puny weapons. They had no weapons. There were only two swords in the land. And one was in the hand of, jo of, of Jonathan. One was in the hands of Saul, his father. And only two spears or swords in the land. Because the Philistines had refused to allow them to, to have any weapons. And all they had were t farm tools. Probably uh, hoes and shovels and picks and uh, homemade uh, clubs. And that's all they had. And the scripture says that panic set into Israel. They began to flee. They began to hide in the caves, the Bible said. They hid in pits and they hid in, every, in mountainsides and uh, others uh, fled the nation. They went over the borders to other countries so they could avoid being conscript, conscripted. Where were those 330,000 men that saw the great victory over the Ammonites? Where are these who said, we wanted a king, and here's the king, and they're all forsaking him, and even his 3,000 bodyguards, well trained, are now down to 600. And they're all fleeing, and the Bible said, those who followed Saul followed him trembling. There was panic. Now, before this battle was to take place, before Israel could move, in fact, this was the consultation, I believe, that Samuel had when he first met and went on a rooftop with Samuel. He said, I'm going to anoint you. But he said, I want you to know that God wants it known to the whole world, to all the Philistines, to the Ammonites, to everybody, that the victory does not come by strategy, it doesn't come by plans of man, but by sacrificing to Almighty God through prayer and confidence in God. No other way. And to prove that we're going to sacrifice before we go into battle, you will always meet me at Gilgal. And when you go there, you wait seven days. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about the uh, meaning of the seven days. There's, there's no great thing to it. It probably took him seven days to get from one end. He's having a feast as to get there. We, we, we hear him talk of three and four days traveled at one time. And he's an older man now. It, it, it was... He was thinking, give me time. I will be there, but it will not be longer than seven days. Don't sacrifice. Don't move. Don't act. Don't go to war. Do nothing. Do nothing at all. But trust my word. Just trust. And I tell you, this, this is uh, some sight as we see... People fleeing, and if you were in Saul's position, and you're sitting there, and everybody is scattering from you. Everybody is fleeing. You've got this massive army drawing closer, and you hear the rumbling of these chariots. And he's looking around, and he has nothing to fight with, and there are no weapons. And you say, you ought, God ought to cut, cut this man some slack. <laughs> There's nothing there. This is hopeless. Under any measurement, this is an absolutely hopeless scene. How is this man going to come against this huge, massive army when people are fleeing him? Nobody has confidence in God anymore. There's, there's, there's nothing there. and He's waiting six days. He waits to the seventh. And folks, I want you to know that this man was being tested by God. He's being tested because God's, God knows that this is one of a begin, one crisis of many that are going to follow, many battles that are going to come. And how is he going to approach it? Is he going to approach it on his wit and wisdom? Is he going to approach it in the flesh, strategizing, manipulating, scheming? Or is he going to say, I'm going to do nothing till I hear from God? I'm going to do nothing but trust the Lord and what He commands me to do. Every command, everything He tells me to do, by His Word, I will obey it, live or die. And what God wanted out of this man was to look at his scene as hopeless it was and say, God, you anointed me. 
You called me. You told me to do nothing but trust the word, the commandment of God. And God has given this man six days. Listen, God knew every step Samuel was taking. It's the seventh day. It's, now it's the, dawn, the, the, the night is coming. It's probably darkness now. Seven days are almost over. But I want you to know God would never deceive this man. He told him to wait seven days. God would not deceive him in the process. So I tell you, on the authority of God's word, Samuel was there before midnight. He was there on time. It wasn't there his time. And God allowed conditions to spin out of control. He's testing this man. So you're going to have to have faith. You're going to have to believe my word because you are going to be in a lifetime of crisis like this. Are you going to take matters in your own hand? Are you going to act in your own strength? Or will you trust me? Because I'm looking for a man after my heart. A man after God's heart is a trusting man before the sons of men. Samuel was on God's navigational system. He knew every step. He knew the moment he would arrive. The Lord could have, could have done anything. He could have sent a wagon and, and some fast horses. He could have put him on a fast horse. He could have brought them there the first, second, or third day. He could have brought them. But no, he's waiting. See, God's allowing this thing to spin out of control. And I'll tell you, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're in a crisis right now, and you've been waiting, and you've been praying and saying, Where is he? Where is he? Where is God? Where's the answer? And you're being tested. Oh, you're being tested because now everything is spinning out of control. And by every measurement, it's hopeless. Your financial situation, is it? A marriage problem? Uh, you... Get a telephone call from a son or a daughter, and, and your daughter tells you you're going to she, uh, she's divorcing your son-in-law. Uh, is it is it a call that somebody has in your family has terminal cancer, and things are spinning out of control, and it looks hopeless to you? Well, folks, that's what we face. Life is one crisis after another. Whenever. A problem comes, either our family, children, grandchildren. I've told my wife, I said, honey, that's problem 190. I mean, 1,900, 1,991 is right behind it. He's taken us through all of them. He's going to take us through this one. Hallelujah. This man is being tested. You see, surely God could not expect this man to just do nothing. That's what God said. Samuel said, you don't do anything till I get there. And until the enemy sees us worshiping the Lord, sacrificing to his name, until we seek the face of God for his direction. No other movement. Doing nothing. Oh, brother, sister, that is the hardest thing in the world. Not to pick up the phone, not to try to make things happen. I waited God long enough. So, so, so Saul uh, has the has the stones erected, and he, he now I don't I really don't believe he sacrificed himself because a height of the priest was there, no doubt did the sacrificing. The sin is not that he took on the role of a priest that was not his calling, and and I don't see that at all. God is after faith. He's after he's trying to get this man to trust him, to be obedient to the word of God. But somewhere that day, I don't know whether it's the second, third, fourth, fifth, or did it wait to the seventh day, but somewhere along the line, God saw the decision this man made. This man decided to go it alone. He decided to do it his way. He was no longer going to wait on God. In fact, when Samuel did appear, he said, it's because you didn't show up on time. And what he's really saying, God didn't show up on time. Now, he, uh, the amazing thing is you watch this, exp listen to the explanation of Saul. Now, here's a spirit-led, anointed man. He said, Samuel, I had to do something. And the, in, in essence, was I had to do something. Everybody was leaving me. 
I and Jonathan were the only ones would be left. What was I to do? Surely I'm not expected to just sit here and do nothing while they come. They could come and, and kill me. And at first glance, God seems to be awfully harsh in his reaction to this. That seems like such a natural thing to do. Man's in trouble, he should do something about it. Have you ever heard anybody tell you, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? No, it's, Lord, what are you going to do about it? Samuel said, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now he would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now folks, keep in mind that Saul had just, in, the, in, in chapter 12, had just been warned about the kind of decision he'd make. If you will not listen to the voice of the Lord but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and it would, as it was against your fathers. Now, what does this have to do with you and me today? Because you and I face the same challenge because we have the same word given to us, the same commandment of the Lord, that we are to fully trust God and do nothing on our own without His direction, without seeking Him, without waiting upon the Lord. We are not to panic. We are not to fear. We are to trust Him, not only to the point of death, but to death. As Job said, though He slay me, yeah, uh -huh. we'll trust God up to a point. We give Him a deadline, and then it's all gone. Boy, God gets more deadlines than anybody in the universe. I don't give de deadlines anymore. I used to, but I got so messed up. Dead God never did... Pay much attention to my deadlines. <laughs> you see, we've been commanded to trust the Lord and, 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 and have and walk this walk of absolute confidence in the Lord, even though you see things spinning apart, uh, uh, spinning out of control, even though it looks absolutely hopeless, it gets worse by the day, and you're sitting there in, in panic and in fear. Now, folks, God saw that huge Philistine army coming. He, 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 would, he knew the thoughts of every one of those Philistine soldiers. He numbered every hair on their head. He knew every movement. He was in their inner council. He knew God at any moment could send an angel and kill them all. He did it once, remember, at 185,000 by one angel. Maybe if he sent two, it would kill a million. One angel could have done it. God could have done, God has his ways that are so beyond our ways. You see, God sees your problem and he knows what you're up against. And some of you wonder, does God really know, does, is, is God really caring? Because I don't see any evidence of him moving and there is no human way I can conceive how this thing can be solved. I don't however pay this debt. I don't know how this thing can ever work out. I've got family problems. I've got marriage problems. I've got career problems and job problems. And, and, and folks, we get all stressed out. And then we come to church to offer our wonderful sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Scripture, here's what God has commanded us. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Impossible. And they that come to him must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of them that seek him diligently. Trust in him at all times, O ye people. Pour your heart out before him. He is your refuge. You who fear the Lord, trust in him. He's your help and your shield. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. No, folks, God doesn't cut any slack. For those who claim to be his children, who have been commanded to trust him at all times, God doesn't cut slack. Oh, yes, but he's patient. You say, well, Pastor Dave, there are times that, that I've been in a crisis and fear has come upon me. Yes, we've all been there. There are questions. He said, bring forth your strong reasons. 
All the patriarchs had those moments where they, they, they wanted to die. They said, God, take my life. I can't handle this anymore. There have been every man of God, every woman of God in the scripture, then and now, even under in the New Testament times, we've all gone through that. There are times I would have loved the Lord just take me home. I just I want to do my job and get out of here. And yes, he's patient, and he, as he, even Christ, our blessed Savior, said, Father, why have you forsaken me? He had those moments, not of doubt, but of questions. And the Lord's patient, he waits. He waited seven days for Saul to settle those questions. God waits for a while for you to settle and get back into the Word of God and get found and remember everything he's told you. Remember his commandments. Remember his Word to, to obey his Word. His obey, to obey this is to believe what he said. Without faith, you can't please Him. He is your refuge. If you will trust Him, He's your refuge and strength. Come what may. Let the consequences be what they are. Don't look at the situation. Don't worry about the consequences because every man and woman who fully trusts God to the end of every crisis will be honored. There is honor to the glory of God and peace and joy as you've never experienced in any other thing. I've got to hurry on. <clears throat> Let me show you the dire consequences of not trusting God to the end of your crisis. <clears throat> Saul goes downhill from this time on because God sees what is in his heart. God knows that he's made his choice. That nothing is ever going to change him now because he's set his course. <clears throat> and uh, primarily because it appeared that he was successful in doing it on his own. All he has of this warning and he didn't even believe that. That his kingdom was taken from him. And uh, <clears throat> they were rejoicing and he's still giving praises to God. But from that moment on, Saul becomes a legalist. Number one, he becomes a legalist of the worst kind. After he sinned the sin of unbelief, uh, he waits in confusion. Nothing's happened. And while he's waiting in confusion, not knowing what to do, and God's not speaking to him, his son Jonathan, with his, with his uh, armor bearer, climbs a, a steep cliff and and takes on a whole garrison of the Philistines, and there's such confusion, panic breaks out in the Philistine camp, and there's a roar that shakes the earth, the Bible says, and Saul doesn't even know what's going on. And the word, bring, he sees, he looks out over this great valley, and there was such confusion, they were fighting among themselves and killing one another. And Saul gathers, blows a trumpet and gathers as many as he can, and they, they join the battle, and there's a great victory accomplished that day the Philistines are slain left and right and all day long Israel they come out of the caves now they come from everywhere and, and suddenly the Philistines are on the run and all day they fight with a sword in their hands and they're weary and they're tired and Saul saw their weariness and he, he made a vow he said cursed be the man who eats anything or touches any food until this battle's over. Cursed it is he. In other words, he's a dead man. And so nobody ate. They kept on. Some of them were fainting. And, and Jonathan didn't hear his father's curse. And so he's in the woods and he's slaying Philistines. And, and in a moment of respite, he sees uh, uh, a beehive. And he sees honey dripping. And he, he puts his weapon into it and starts... Uh, eating the honey and he's refreshed. And in about evening time, the people couldn't take it anymore and they, they rush into the spoil and they, they are slaying animals with the blood and just uh, roasting it and eating it without uh, uh, honoring the, the, the Jewish law that you don't eat meat with the blood. It's drained of its blood first. They were breaking the law. Saul sees it and he goes into a rage. He said, you have acted treacherously. Now roll me a great stone quickly. 
You have sinned against the Lord by eating with blood. You people have broken the law. Here's a man living in total rebellion. Sinning the greatest sin that you can sin in the eyes of Almighty God. But he's now going to be a holiness preacher. Of the worst kind. He turns to legalism. Folks, that is the first downward spiraling step toward the occult, toward spiritual insanity. When you do not trust the covenant promises of God to give you your righteousness and holiness. When you turn away from that, you said, no, I've got to add something to that. You're on your way down, just like Saul was. And what will happen to you? And listen very closely. Even though you have sinned against God. Because when you don't believe his promises. That he will subdue your sins if you will trust him. If you will call on his name. The Holy Ghost will instill his fear into your heart. He said I will cause you to walk in my ways. And you believe the Holy Ghost to do what God promised him to do. If you refuse all of these covenant promises of God. And you say no. I've got to do it. I've got to dress a certain way. I've got to add something. Then I've got to prove to God that I am holy. And you refuse the righteousness of Christ and you go out to establish your own righteousness. And this is what he's doing now. He's establishing his own righteousness. And when you do that, you become God's cop. Not God's cop, but in your mind, God's cop. And now I believe the priests were applauding Saul at this time. Saul, thank God for the stand you're taking. They're, they're sinning. This is the law. You don't eat with blood. Isn't that amazing? That same night, Saul decides to, to keep them up all night. He said, we're going to finish this. We're going we're to go all night long. And we're going to finish this battle. We're going to wipe them all out. And the people are tired. They're weary. Some of them are asleep. They can't even move. And... So the, the priest said, well, at least we've got to ask God. We've got to ask God. And so the, the priest, I don't know, it was a human thumb, and I don't know what, how, how they, they, they tried to uh, approach God, but the Lord wouldn't answer. And because he didn't answer, Saul said, as the Lord lives, somebody has sinned. God's not talking. It was his sin. But you see, he doesn't see that. He, he said, somebody has sinned. And so help me, even if it's my son, I'll kill him. Oh, he's got zeal for God, doesn't he? What a righteous man now before the whole crowd. We have sinned against God. We have sinned against the Word. And now God has shut us out. There's a reason. We've got to, we've got to appease God now. And so he cast Lot and the Lot falls upon him and his son. And he said, well, I know it's not me. It's got to be you. And if God hadn't intervened, he'd have killed his own son in an act of zealous, uh, of, of zeal, outward zeal to appear before the people that he kept the law that he was a holy, righteous man. You become a legalist of the worst kind. Unbelief is the root cause of all legalism. It's the root cause of all. Now you see Stahl striving to look holy, striving to put a, uh, on a crusade. F folks, there, there are godly crusaders, but some of them scare me to death. Like, you know, we've got a million women going to be marching in Washington soon against uh, or for gun control. That, I'm not going to get involved in the politics of that. But I heard a commentator on the radio said, how many of those women are going to go out there and parade and take a stand and crusade against guns, and yet they say nothing about their kids watching all of this murder on television and everything else that it incites the use of guns? It's legalism. You know what God's been hounding me about in a loving way? He's saying, David, if you're going to stand in front of the congregation and, and expose sins of others, you better make sure you're trusting me in your life about how you get your own righteousness. You better be walking in faith. Hallelujah. It's not a threat, just a loving reminder from the Heavenly Father. And secondly, 
When you become a legalist, first of all, when, when there's unbelief, when you don't obey God's word and doing what he told you to simply wait and trust him and believe him in your crisis, you, you become a legalist, you'll see others' sins and weaknesses and you'll expose them, you, you will focus on everybody's sin but your own. Then, secondly, there'll be a loss of all spiritual discernment, a seared conscience, and total oblivion to sin. Sin loses exuding sinfulness in your eyes. Saul is told to go against Amalek, utterly destroy all that is of Amalek, put to death everything, everyone that breathes, spare nothing, kill all the sheep, the cattle, the oxen, donkeys, everything. Let nothing remain. Saul saves the king as a trophy, King Agag, and the people saved and spared all the best cattle, and, and, and when it says the best of everything, it was the best of clothes, the, the best of furniture. Folks, it, what a sight that must have been when Samuel arrived on the scene. What a sight that must have been. Listen to this man. He... he, he, he he goes, right after the victory, he, he goes to Carmel and he builds a monument to the victory and to himself. A monument. We have achieved a great victory. We have obeyed God. We have wiped out the Amalekites. And the king is standing right by him smiling when Samuel arrives. And there are herds, as far as you can see, of Sheep and donkeys and cattle. And folks, it's like a, it, it, it is like a gigantic flea market. Folks, you've got to, you've got to see this. It, it's not written there, but it, it, the circumstances, circumstantially, what you see here are people uh, bartering what they have gotten from the spoil. And they're trading sheep for donkeys and donkeys for uh, camels and uh, and examining the teeth of the horses and see if they're good and 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 everybody's showing what they've got and and thousands of sheep are bleeding. I mean, a roar. There's the smell, the stench of sacrifices that are not of God. When Samuel comes on the scene. Saul, uh, Samuel is absolutely aghast at what he sees. He couldn't take it all in. He's thinking, how can this man of God be so blind? Samuel says, Saul, what have you done? He listened to what he said. I have, I have carried out the command of the Lord. God be praised. And the whole time he can hardly hear Saul because of the sheep. God said, kill all the sheep. He said, I have absolutely done everything I've been told. And, and Saul's standing there saying, I don't believe this man. Look at the crowd, look at all the sheep, look at the clothes, look at the garments, look at the way they've gone mad. He says, I have fulfilled everything. And, and there is King Agag. The Bible said he was at peace because he thought it was all over. He's going to be spared. And he's standing there smiling and nodding. You know, he did it. He killed all my people. Why did you not, Saul, Samuel said, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you do this evil in the sight of the Lord? And he comes back again. But I did obey the voice of the Lord. I accomplished the mission I was sent to do. It's the beginning of witchcraft, according to the scripture. Because the scripture goes on. Samuel looks him right in the eye and he said, Saul, you've rebelled. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness and is an iniquity and idolatry. You know what he's saying? Refuse to trust God is equal to witchcraft in God's eyes. It's rebellion. It's witchcraft. Same thing. If 
folks, that's where the occult, the seed of the occult is planted in the hearts of many, many people. Christians who end up stargazing and, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, put more faith in Dr. Joy Brown or Dr. <laughs> the lady doctors on radio all the time. Uh, oh, they'll sit there and, and they'll get their direction from these people. They don't trust God. That's the occult. Who are these Christians that, that can indulge in any kind of sin now, in adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and everything else, and then come and say, well, I've saved the best for the Lord, so they come to God's house and say, now I bring you my sacrifice. He said, we've done all this to sacrifice to your God. The Bible says, this is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done no wrong. She doesn't ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable, and she doesn't know it. Her ways are unstable. She says, I haven't done it. She has just committed adultery. She is blatantly in sin, and she wipes her mouth and said, everything's okay. I didn't do anything wrong. And she doesn't know. This man now is blind. And folks, when you give, when you give yourself over to doing things your way, to manipulate and scheme and plan because you feel somehow God has not acted on time, you will lose your discernment. This is the first thing that goes, discernment. Well, you can't discern between what is right and wrong because you're moving in a realm of unbelief. Where God can't work, where God can't move, it's an arena that God will have nothing to do with, and you're all alone. And then, the seared conscience, and a total oblivion to sin. He, he, he now becomes cavalier about sin. Everything, it, it, it doesn't bother anymore. He has sinned and rebelled before Almighty God, and he's saying... I haven't done anything wrong. Thirdly, when there's a loss of discernment and the conscience has been shackled, there's no defense left against the spirit of jealousy and envy. And I've seen this all my lifetime. I've seen it in preachers. I've seen it in Christian works. I've seen it in marriages all over. I've seen people who, who have not believed that God could heal their marriage, would not trust God. Folks, it only takes one who really, really believes. Now, it, it's, it, it, that doesn't mean that there won't be divorce because God will not force himself on stubborn people. And that's, that's the lesson in this whole story here. The Bible said he was a stubborn man, stubbornly set in his ways. And, and a stubborn man will not receive the grace of God. He'll not receive the mercy that's offered to him. But you see, now the Spirit of the Lord, Scripture said, left Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Now God did not send an evil spirit. The Bible said he doesn't do that. What he did, he allowed the inevitable to happen. God knew that inevitably when a, a person loses spiritual discernment, and they've turned to legalism and they, they have unbelief in their heart. It's inevitably going to lead in this attack. There's no defense left. And what does mean? God allowed his defenses to go down and this evil spirit. And that terrorizing spirit is a spirit of jealousy and envy. Yes. Jealousy and envy. <laughs> David is brought in on the scene now because uh, Saul is having uh, demonic attacks and he's having demonic spasms and he's ranting and raving all through his home, all through his uh, <coughs> residence. His servants are frightened and they call David in and with his harp and with his psalms he sings peace to this man. He appoints him as his bodyguard, takes him with us to battle. And one day they're coming from a battle, and Saul's the head of the army, and David's behind in the army. And here came the women from Jerusalem, and they're singing, Saul has killed his thousands, 
but David is killed of ten thousands. Saul was in a rage, and Saul looked on David from that time on with suspicion, with envy. He looked on him now with envy. The Bible said Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was not with him, but had departed from, the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Saul dreaded him, grew insanely jealous of him. Folks, jealousy turns Christians into hideous creatures. Hideous creatures. There, there's nothing uh, more tragic than a jealous husband or wife, for example. Do you know there, there are men in this church that can't even shake hands with other women because their wife is shooting daggers at him? And God help if he gives a God bless you to her. Gets in the car. I saw it. I saw it. You've had your eyes on her all along, haven't you? I, and I know she has her eyes on you. She wouldn't be coming up trying to shake it. Every service, she comes to you and shakes hands. And I know what's in your heart. Because you see, when you lose your discernment, and you can't trust God, you can't trust anybody. And you will put on others what is in your own heart. Oh, oh, by the way, sir. There are men in this congregation. W women come into this house and actually scared to sit down where there's an empty seat. And that's maybe why, well, I better not mention why some of you are sitting on the end. Because my wife is sitting on the end. <laughs> but, God help. That dear wife, if, if some nice-looking guy sits beside her, the whole service, <laughs> he can't praise God. He's watching whether he makes some kind of move or, or just touch her. And he stands and he's looking at her the whole time. He's, I, I have seen these insanely jealous people. And it's hideous. Horrifying. What happens? The jealous person perceives himself or herself to always be the victim. Everybody's against them. Someone's always talking about them. They say, people are jealous of me. I'm being persecuted. Everywhere I go, I am being persecuted. I have taken more junk from people than anybody you know. You ever hear the language of this, this raging jealousy in the heart? Let me show you one of the most pitiful scriptures in all the Bible. I consider this scene to be absolutely pitiful. Saul is pursuing David. He's wanting to kill him. And, and uh, he takes a break and he's, he's brooding under a tamarisk tree. And he's, his soldiers are surrounding him and his servants are there ministering to him. They're risking their lives for him. And this poor man now, this self-pity... Poor me. I am persecuted. And this man is full of jealousy and envy. And listen to what he says. He looks at all of his servants and soldiers who are, who are risking their lives. They're, they're up guarding him, in fact. They're all around him guarding their king. And Saul says, and all of you have conspired against me. So that there's not one of you who disclosed to me when my son made a covenant with the son of Jesse. There's none of you who's sorry for me. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> all of you. You're all conspirators. You're all traitors. That's what jealousy will do. Envy. When you can't glorify God when somebody your age or younger is blessed by God beyond anything you've ever known in your life. And that jealousy sets in. Folks, where does that come from? That's a, somewhere along the line, you made a decision to walk in the flesh. You didn't make a decision to go to prayer with everything that would attack you from hell. You didn't say, you didn't make up your mind. If I get a, 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 some kind of jealousy coming on me, if the enemy tries to put that spirit on me, I'm going to run to the cross. I'm going to run to Jesus. I'm going to wait on the Lord for deliverance. My covenant... You allowed that thing to go on. 
Boy, how sad it is to come home from Macedonia or Kosovo or come home from some mission field where people are dying and there's hunger and people have no heat and few clothes and little food and, and you see these scenes and you see the world scene and you see the greatness of God's plan and you come home to some Christian all wrapped up in a petty little jealousy battle and you go to lunch with them and all they talk about you're so full of the needs of the world and you're so full of the eyes of God as he sees the lost world and you've got this grand world scheme of love and seeking God and they're saying do you know what so and so said about me the other day do you know what I've been through can you understand what I'm going through you know what my husband did to me you know what he said I am being persecuted in my own home I've got Christians at Times Square Church talking about me and you're sitting there and they've got this little world because jealousy shrinks your whole world leaves you nothing but focus this man is focused on nothing more he should have been focused on the enemies of God the Philistines and others he has to be yanked away by a bad report to get away from his puny little battle with David your world is nothing I, I was uh, oh, I got a Where did you get that jealous spirit? You can say, I hate it. Check the time that you were in a crisis. Go back to that time when God was testing you. And what decision did you make? Did you have that something in your heart that said, God, you failed me? Did you, did you set out to solve your problem on your own? That's where it starts. What a tragic end now. I told you to go to First Samuel, and I wouldn't have sent you there without a purpose. 20th chapter. I'm going to close. <clears throat> 28. Start with verse 3. First Samuel 28. Now Samuel was dead. Are you with me? Yes. Samuel was dead, and all Israel lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. The Philistines gathered against themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Europe, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, in other words, a witch, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there's a woman that hath a familiar spirit in indoor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And you know the story how he said conjure up Samuel verse 15 how sad Samuel said to Saul why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up and Saul answered I am sore distressed for the Philistines make war against me and God is departed from me and answers me no more neither by prophets nor by dreams therefore I have called thee that thou mayest make known to me what I should do then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy? The Lord has rent the kingdom from you. What a sad ending. The last consultation with the witch. Now, folks, listen to me, please. We live in a New Testament age. Saul had mercy available to him. If he'd not had such a stubborn heart, if he hadn't set his heart to do things his own way, God could have delivered him. But I want you to know that something happened between that story and where you and I live today. It's called the cross. Where Jesus took all of our rebellion. He took all of our sins. And at any point, at any point, you could be at any point in this downward spiral. You could have this, this, this legalistic spirit. If you turn to the Lord, he, he has made provision that you can be set free. Hallelujah. There is no witchcraft. There's nothing of the occult. 
that can withstand the hand of God. All God has to do is speak the word. If you will turn to him, repent, you can be delivered. Saul was not delivered, but you and I can be delivered. I have been delivered. Many of you have been delivered. There is deliverance if you call on his name. Hallelujah. You don't have to go the way of Saul. If you found yourself at any point in this message, if you found yourself at any point, there's something there that is like a dagger in your spirit and soul. The Lord invites you to come. He said, don't take another step. Don't go towards spiritual insanity. Don't go to this place where finally you can sit in church and hear any gospel and not be moved. Excuse any kind of sin. And be cavalier about everything and, and, and have no sense of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And that's where many Christians are and they're headed. And it ends up, you, you, you folks, many of those who are in the occult right now were those who turned away from their confidence in God. Many of them. Many of the witches and the covens that are led by witches were those who one time were in Pentecostal churches or Baptist churches. They knew the gospel and they turned away from it, disobeyed the word of the Lord, and that's where they ended. But thank God there is no power in, on earth or in hell that can stop God from reaching a heart that's not stubborn but willing to say, I've sinned before God, Lord, come and deliver me. There's deliverance immediately for those who step out and receive his word. Will you stand, please? Please don't move. Heavenly Father, we come to the most important moment in this service now when we deal with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. My Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have come to me through this word. You've convicted me by this word. And you've, you have told me clearly every crisis from now on Trust me in it and through it. Don't go your own way. Trust me. Do nothing. Do nothing but pray and trust. Don't move until I tell you to, till the word comes. Till the Lord has been consulted and his will is being performed. Hallelujah. Lord, forgive us for running off our own way, for getting in panic and fear and stressed out when we have a God who's able, a God who knows all things and God who cares for us. Hallelujah. Folks, he loves you today. And he brought this message to you, not to chasten you, but to remind you, to show you a better way. If... if Anything I said in this message was meant for you, and you have to repent of unbelief, or if you have the slightest, that slightest thought that God has not acted on your behalf, that he's not come on the scene on time, and it's left you with just a little bit of doubt, your doubt, your unbelief, is the Father the root cause of all the other sins. You deal with your unbelief. You lay down your unbelief. You say, God, give me the faith of Christ. I want to make that kind of commitment. If you're living in sin, come. If you don't know Jesus, come. If the Holy Spirit's dealing with, don't come until the Spirit of God's dealing with, but if He is dealing with, you feel that polar tug of the Holy Spirit. Up in the balcony, go the stairs on either side and come down. Those that are in the annex, will you move forward, not in front of the screen, but between the screens so you don't block the vision? If you will, please. Someone will be there in just a moment to give you further direction. I want to pray with you. Uh, I can't do anything until the Holy Ghost accomplishes this conviction in your heart. Did God speak to you? If he spoke to you, obey the Holy Spirit now because he's wanting to heal you. He's wanting to move into your crisis now and bring you to that place of absolute utter faith and confidence in him. You know, when I read this story, I wondered if, if Saul, 
any time in his life, a troubled life he was living and God had departed from him. I wonder if there was ever a time he said, if I had only waited a little longer, if I had just trusted a little longer, I wouldn't be in this mess. I could have had the kingdom. Now it's all gone. You say, does it, does it hinge on something that singular? One item? Just one time of unbelief? No, you see, God said he tests us because faith, true faith, true trust in him is more important to him than the purest of gold. He said, I want it to be right to the end before all of mankind. I want your faith to be a praise and an honor, glory to my name. That's why I test you. And some of you are going through the test of your life right now. In a recent test that Gwen and I had, a family uh, test, we, we both agreed we are not going to doubt God. We are going to trust Him through this. We went to prayer and said, Lord, we turn this over to you. Come what may. We were ready to let anything happen. We come to the place where your will be done. We, we know there, there could be tragedy. We know there could be almost anything. The consequences in your hands. And folks, within 48 hours, God moved. God solved. God worked it all out. And, and you know what that does to us? Our hearts were overjoyed. There was something that God put in our hearts. It, it, it was almost like the Lord saying, I am so pleased. I bless you. What a joy knowing that you have trusted God through it. You've come out the other end, your faith stronger. This is the conclusion of the message.